<laughs> so please give a big warm welcome to James Doherty. Let's see here. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yes. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for having me. Thanks, Steve, for that fantastic intro. Um, I am James, and today I'm going to be talking about podcasting before and after you hit record now a little background about me i'm james dari i'm a professional namer naming specialist and brand story specialist which a lot of people go oh that's a thing and yes it is very much a thing i've named products businesses uh for people my niche is passion entrepreneurs but i've also named for fortune 100 companies a freelance for baker naming firms I've worked a lot of projects and we can always talk about that later. I'd love to. But today we're going to talk about podcasts. And I've also launched two podcasts that have gone to top 100 on iTunes. And we're going to talk about that later. Now, first things first, if you want to start a podcast, you have to ask yourself why. Now, 2020 is a big year for podcasts with the coronavirus and the quarantine. People are bored and they're kind of getting around to the things that they said they were going to do and have it. And one of the biggest things is podcasting. So you have to ask yourself, why are you starting your podcast? Some people think it would make them famous. Some people think it would make them money. They want to promote their business. Some people just love to talk. Maybe they want to talk to interesting people. Maybe they want to network. Uh, they want to use it as a promotional effort. Some people use it as a form of therapy, which you can hear in a lot of podcasts. Some as a fun hobby. And a lot of people, especially now with the rise of LinkedIn recently, personal branding is huge. Some people actually use it as a resume or part of their cover letter or even part of their portfolio. Now, here in this business class, I imagine personal branding and networking would be a big reason. Now, there's over 900,000 podcasts. 900,000. But, and new ones launching every day. But a large amount of those have been published within six months, deeming them inactive. And over 70% don't even get started. So, a lot of people have the image in their mind. Um, one of the things I do in my naming business is I name a lot of podcasts. And about 70% of the people, we've gotten to the end of our project. We've got the perfect name. We know what we're going to do, and they don't even start it. And so 70% of people don't even start. And of the rest who do start, most stop after seven episodes. Now, why is this? Instant gratification. I heard you heard this so many times from older people that we are the age of instant gratification. Unfortunately, it's true in podcasting. People stop after seven episodes because they don't have enough listeners or they haven't made money or they haven't gotten sales for their business. And unfortunately, with podcasting, if you build it, they will come does not exactly work. It takes a lot of work to build up a following. I've talked to a few podcast producers who work for HBO, who work for big companies, and they say that independent podcasts take at least a year to start gaining real traction. Now, first thing you can do is find your niche, which I'm sure you hear a lot in your business classes. And once you found your niche, you need to go a little deeper. So maybe you design furniture, but there's probably a lot of podcasts for designing furniture. So maybe you'll want to design specifically furniture for newborns. So that way you'll just attract new mothers or new parents. And maybe your approach is a little different. Maybe the other newborn furniture podcasts are a little stale and you've got a fresh perspective. Now, the reason you want to find this niche is because when these people are looking for that specific thing, like they just have their newborn and now they want to know about the furniture, they're going to go to you, the person who specializes in that specific niche, rather than a furniture podcast who might talk about it in one or two episodes. They're going to go to you who talks about it all the time. You are the expert and you're the person they follow. So these are two podcasts I named. Okay, now what? Kate Fitz Simon. She is a coach in Australia. She actually just moved to the United States. She's going to start up her speaking business here. She speaks at primary schools and high schools, and she talks about resiliency and she talks about um, how to just how to take responsibility for yourself at a young age. So her aim 
our kids who just graduated high school and they're about to go off to college. And so what question do we always ask ourselves? Okay, now what? We just graduated high school. What do we do now? Maybe we just graduated college. What do we do now? So that was the name we came up for hers. And then this guy, David Juhas, he's an NLP hypnosis guide, and he's trying to be the expert in NLP and hypnosis. So Wake in the Mind is what we came up with. These are my two podcasts, Theme Changers, I did about naming, and The Ascenders is the one I do now, and I talk to speakers, entrepreneurs, authors who haven't been featured in the mainstream of the magazines yet, but they're almost there. They're on the cusp. So this is my realm of expertise. Your name is your first impression. So I've named over 200 podcasts from sports to coaching. I name a lot of coaching podcasts. Uh, to a guy sitting at a mic, drinking Dr. Pepper and talking about gay culture. That was a fun, fun experiment. I don't think that guy is doing his podcast anymore. Unfortunately, he fell into the 70%. But it was a fun project. Now, a lot of people want to be the next Joe Rogan. Uh, so you hear a lot, oh, I want to be a Joe Rogan. So a lot of people think, okay, let me just do the My Name Experience show podcast. And I always tell them that that's not a good idea unless you already have a following. Now, Joe Rogan, he was a stand-up comedian for many years. He was on a popular sitcom on NBC called News Radio. And he also hosted Fear Factor, a huge game show. Then he worked on UFC, and then he started his podcast. So he was already pretty well-known before he started his podcast. So his name had meaning. When you see the Joe Rogan experience, you think, oh, Joe Rogan, I know him. He's that comedian. Maybe I'll talk about... You know, being maybe it's going to be funny as a comedian. Maybe you'll talk about UFC because I know he's interested in that. Maybe you'll talk about some other stuff. So you'll tune in because you know who Joe Rogan is. Ben Shapiro, maybe I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but I know that he has a huge following. He's one of the top 10 podcasts in the world. And he has a lot to do with his name. When you hear Ben Shapiro, you know exactly what he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about right wing politics and current culture. I always suggest to add a title and then with your name. Because unfortunately, unless you have a huge following, your name has no meaning. I know the name I show is the James Doherty Show because unfortunately, my name has no meaning. And so Dax Shepard, who's also a famous comedian, he started Armchair Expert with Dax Shepard. Now, I think this is important for any podcast. If you want to build your name, it's important to have your name in the title with, but not be the main focal point. So people will go, oh, armchair expert. That sounds like maybe a comedy show. The, the cover kind of looks like something comedian. Oh, I know Doc Shepard. So if you have no name recognition, your title can be what draws them in. For me, it was name changers. Oh, that's a, that's a pun. You know, that could be about that's about naming. It could be about someone's changing your name, or it could be about company naming. The senders is kind of a play on Avengers, and you learn it's people ascending up to becoming successful. Your podcast cover. So your cover and name immediately tell people about the show. If podcast cover is kind of funky or kind of funny, people are going to be like, okay, this is going to be a funny show. If your name is funny. It's a pun. People are going to be like, this is going to be a funny show. If your name is just the James Darty show, people have no idea what to expect. If the cover is just me going like this, people have no idea what to expect. And some people might think, oh, maybe they'll, since they don't know what to expect, they'll go listen to it. But unfortunately, Right underneath the James Darty show is the Tom Johnson show. And right under that is the Steve Diazio show. And people are not going to listen just based on that. Because, again, it doesn't ring true. It doesn't ring anything in their head. So this is an example right here. When you have a bad podcast cover, people don't want to listen. This is a pod I've never listened to this podcast. And I think that actually contributes to my point. Because I don't want to listen to this podcast after seeing their cover. It's called The Morning Dump. Uh, and the first... The one here on the left was their first cover, and then they changed it to the second one, which I personally don't think is any better. But seeing this gives me a lot of impression that it's kind of amateur, it's kind of cheap, it's kind of weird, kind of dirty. I don't know. It just doesn't make me want to listen. So in this case, I try to say to stay away from Fiverr and Canva when it comes to cover art, because you want people to look at it, and when they see it, it looks professional, and it gives off exactly what's your name is about. So I suggest people find a graphic designer. Now, being in college, there's graphic designers all over the place in the art department. I don't know how big USF's art department is, but I imagine there's people who are hungry to get some portfolio pieces out. 
they're going to give you a discounted rate. They're going to do good work and they're going to be ready to do it for you. I found a graphic designer through a friend of mine and she actually created my cover for the Ascenders, which I love. And my friend Deja, she created her cover called How to Be Afraid. And these all were less than $100 and they were done within a week or two. And I think they're fantastic. So if you find maybe through friends, you find um, a graphic designer, it's better than Fiverr. You don't know what you're going to get. You don't know the person. And Canva, if the thing about Canva is you're going to use templates. And, uh, you know, let's be honest. I'm lazy. A lot of people are lazy. They're going to find a template that's good. They're going to put the name on it, and then they're going to be good to go. And I see that in a lot of podcasts. But the problem is, is when you find another podcast using the same template, it, it kind of looks cheap. Like, oh, they just use that. So having a fresh art that's fresh to you, it's always the best option. The music sets the tone and feeling of the audio. This you could use five or four, but I suggest using a local musician. Here in Florida, we have tons of local musicians. You could find a lot online, and they're all happy to sink their teeth into this project. And a lot of them have home studios, so they can give you really professional sounding audio. And again, a lot of them are hungry, so they'll give you a nice rate. So now you're ready to record. So this is called Anchor. So I always have to talk about this. I've never actually used it, but it's a company that's owned by Spotify. And the idea is that it is an all-in-one platform. You log into the app, you get to create your show, you can record directly into the app, and then it publishes it on every platform. Problem is, is that the little Anchor logo is posted on your cover. Now, a lot of people see this as kind of cheap in the podcast world, is not taken seriously. Um, some people say it's just a really easy way to get started. So if you're someone who's just trying to get started quickly, maybe don't have a huge budget, maybe you just want to get your voice out there, or maybe using this in overall grand scheme of your personal branding, Anchor might be a good option for you. But if you're really you know, intent on making a quality podcast, I'd say stay away from Anchor. So budget. So it depends on how professional you want to be. If you want to really make like an NPR style podcast, you're going to be spending money on a lot of things. But if you want to make a simple podcast that's quality, sounds good, sounds good enough, um, you're looking at about probably I'd say like $300 to get started. So this is the budget I did. So the cover, like I said, it was around $100. It could be anywhere up to 100 to 150 Equipment, microphone, got a blue Yeti here, simple, about $100. It's kind of a standard for starting. Um, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Hosting, I'm going to talk about that later in the slide, but that's about 100 a year. And software, I say 250 It's about $20 a month, um, $25 a month. Yeah, $20 a month. So I'll talk about that as well. Equipment, like I said, I got the Blue Yeti here. It's kind of a standard for starting podcasts. They also have the AT2020 USB. Both $100 or under. Both are quality. A lot of big name podcasts that a lot of you guys probably listen to use these microphones. And there's a lot of really great software to elevate them. A lot of people use the Blue Yeti for Twitch, like for streaming and for podcasting. So there's a lot of really good software to enhance it. There's a lot of plugins to enhance it. Same with the AT2020. And I suggest USB microphones. So the reason you want a USB microphone is when you go into this other stuff, you have to get a mixing board, you have to get this equipment. Is forget about all that USB, you plug it right in. So the AET2020 USB and the Blue Yeti plugs right into your computer and you can use it in any of your software. Uh, hosting. So you're going to want to host your podcast. There's a lot of services that do it. There's a lot of new ones that are popping up for free. Unfortunately, and this has been happening recently, a lot of ones pop up and then they fail. And then the ones that they were hosting completely disappear. And a lot of times it's without even telling their people. It's really weird, but that's what happens when a fresh new niche opens up. So the two most reliable ones are Libsyn and Podbean. I use Podbean. And the thing is, is that with these, since they're quality, you're going to be spending some money. So for mine on Podbean, $100 a year, but it uploads to every single outlet, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Google, and just the brand new Amazon just launched their podcast service. And the day of launch, which was early this week, Podbean put mine on there. So I was really reliable. It's $100 a year, and it's unlimited space hosting. So you can upload your file, and it holds it for you. Libsyn has similar things. Just you know, research which one's best for you. Those are the two I definitely suggest. Software, also called a DAW. So if you ever heard the term DAW, that's what it is. 
Audacity is the standard for beginners. It's free. It's good. It's been around forever. I remember when I was like in high school, I used it. Maybe middle school, I used it. It's been around forever. It's quality and it's reliable. But if you want to get a little more, if you want to get a little more professional, I use Adobe Audition, $20 a month. And for the $20, $25 a month, you get to use some other Adobe products, which is great. And then Pro Tools will always be the industry standard. And that's about $30 a month. I always suggest start with Audacity, get a feel for it. And then if you want to get a little better, more options, upgrade. So now what do you do when you have your podcast recorded? You got your cover, you got your theme music, you're ready to go. First week when you launch, you have to get as many reviews as possible. Now what this does is it shoots you up the chart. Now I was lucky I had, um, I was able to get a lot of my friends to submit some reviews for me when I launched the Ascenders. And the first week I was number 81 on the Entrepreneurship Podcast in America, above Noah Kagan, who I absolutely love. I think it's a great podcast. And in Singapore, for some reason, I was number four right under Gary Vee, which is awesome. And I love that. No idea how. I don't think I know very many people in Singapore. But if people look at the charts, then you'll find they'll find you. Maybe people who listen to Gary V and see him on the chart and see you right under. But come listen. And fun part, this is actually my charts now. As you can see, I've gone down a lot. I'm still doing okay in Japan and Indonesia. But after that first week, you go down. And that's when you have to consider doing more work. But going back to being in the top 100 on your LinkedIn, now you can say host of top 100 podcast. And that's fun. So that's that's a bit of a way to leverage the importance of your podcast. And you can use that when getting guests. Now, the number one way to gain listeners is to be featured on podcasts or blogs in your niche. This is the classic 100% the way to do it. Now, there's a guy, oh, Guy Raz is a very famous NPR host, and he hosts How I Built This on NPR. Huge show, really, really famous in the business space. He interviews entrepreneurs that are very successful to see their secrets, to see their resiliency, and just find out their backstory. Now, this week, he's actually launching a book about How I Built This, and to promote it, he's doing exactly what I said. He's going on business podcasts. This is from my feed. This is just five. I've actually found eight this week that he's been on. He's been on all of these podcasts in one week. And these podcasts all have different audiences. They're all in the kind of the same realm of entrepreneurship. But they all have their own set of audiences, and they all have their own set of people that they reach. Tim Ferriss alone, I think he reaches about 4 million people. And then all these other people have their own little niches. So this shows you that even if you're big, even if you have name recognizability like Guy Raz, he still is going to go on these other podcasts and he's still going to promote. So unfortunately, when you're starting out, you're not going to be able to get on these big guys, but you can get find, like I said, if you're doing child furniture, you can find a podcast that's doing talking about furniture or talking about interior design, contact them and just say, Hey, you know, this is what I'm doing. My podcast, can I be a guest? A lot of podcasts are looking for guests and a lot of times looking for guests is bit of a time suck so if they have someone coming to them with an interesting story they're going to be interested um and also i'm going to read this in business class when you send the email try to tell them how it's going to benefit them so guess what you now have your top 100 podcasts you could say hey i'm the host of top 100 podcast and so your title i'd love to be on your show now as far as social media goes this is a great tool called headliner I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen on Instagram, maybe on Twitter, that a lot of podcasts, um, they have videos where maybe it's a still photo and it's kind of, you know, that audio stream and you click it and it plays a clip of the podcast with a photo behind it. They're using Headliner or something similar. And it's a free service up to 10 videos a month and you can make it right in the app or in the website and then post it onto your Instagram Really great tool. Otherwise, quote cards are huge. Like Gary V does, he does just a quote with a nice background, um, and then videos and having your guests promote. A great way to do that on social media. You can always contact me, uh, Jay at jamespdarty.com. Uh, on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn a lot, and my name is JP Darty fifty one. And thank you so much for having me. 
you know, I'll take any questions you got. I think Steve actually wanted me to talk a little bit about Toastmasters, so I'm going to talk about that for a minute. I've been part of Toastmasters for a few years now. Um, James, I've actually, oh, real quick, could, um, maybe you could stop the screen sharing so then we can have a one-on-one -on -one Q and A. With oh, our... you got it. Yeah. Let's see. How do you stop? There it is. All right. Can you see me? Maybe. Uh, maybe you can put your video on. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Excellent, James. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, you gave us specific tools and an action plan of how to launch a podcast and what we need to do before, during, and after in order to be recognized, use it if it's for business or personal branding. So I, I'm very grateful for what you shared. Endless amount of learning. I always learn a, a great deal uh, when I hear from you. Uh, in your speeches and your topics. And to lead into that is is a bit about how did you, or what have you been doing to help prepare yourself for, for podcasting? And I know we've talked about Toastmasters, but how has that influenced, or what is Toastmasters? And how has that influenced uh, your podcasting and, and some of your other uh, endeavors? Oh, great question. Uh, yeah, Toastmasters, international organization, the clubs all over the world. Um, Steve and I met at downtown St. Pete Toastmasters over at St. Pete College. Um, and it's just a great organization, clubs everywhere. People meet up and we speak. You know, we have prepared speeches through a curriculum through Toastmasters, or there's impromptu speaking called Table Topics, one to two minutes of impromptu, off the top of the head, improv speaking. And there's also evaluations. So two to three minutes of someone talking about how you could improve your speech or what you did well. And it's just a great place to be. You meet a lot of incredible people and you learn how to better yourself immediately that day. And I think we're all just trying to become better at what we do. So I've been in for a couple of years now and it's taught me the ability to get up in front of a crowd without being scared of doing this, talking for what, 20, 30 minutes without a second thought. It's, I don't know if I could do this a couple of years ago, but now it's it just comes easy to me because I've done so many speeches and Toastmasters and I've done impromptu speaking so much. It's been absolutely helped me. And additionally with, so with podcasts, I always suggest Toastmasters um, and I always suggest practicing. If you haven't done something like Toastmasters or start a YouTube channel, do fake interviews. I remember when I, just before I joined Toastmasters, I tried to do this podcast and I had a girlfriend at the time and I had her pretend to be uh, a guest, so she played a character, and I just pretended to interview her to try to build up the chops. So things like that are always a great way to just get better at it. So I'm curious, part of my, so one thing that you touched on is, is the, the research part, and a lot of, for my classes, the students have to solve a challenge and they have to do an extensive amount of research. And, and you talked about you know knowing your niche and then going deeper. So I appreciate you sharing that because th that element of knowing your environment, knowing where you fit, knowing the problem, knowing the the opportunities or the gaps, you know that's ultimately going to direct you where you need to go. What I'm most curious is before you hit record or in preparation uh, for your first or last podcast or whatever, uh, where does the role of script writing or having a detailed itinerary or schedule for that type of podcast come in and, and what can students uh, or anyone do to help prepare that instead of being completely impromptu, which provides its own challenges and opportunities, I guess. Great question. Really great question. Um, I, I didn't have time to touch on that in my, in my uh, presentation, but it's definitely really, really important. And the key comes down to what kind of show you want. So if you're a big fan of Joe Rogan, he just talks to people very loosely. He probably has a sheet that has some topics on it that he wants to touch on, and then they could talk on it. That's a great way to do it if you're doing a very loose interview show. Um, if you're doing an interview show that's very that has very high profile guests, like Tom Billy with Impact Theory, he researches like crazy. He reads their books, he goes on their Instagram, he watches every YouTube video, and then he writes a short bio about them and then touches on touch points he wants to touch on. And that also impresses the guest, so they'll be more open to talk to you. 
if you're doing um, just you and your friend talking, again, just a list of touch points, things you want to talk about, and maybe time it out. So that way, if you're trying to stick to just an hour, you know, we'll talk about this for a few minutes, talk about this for a few minutes, talk about this for a few minutes. Now, getting into the more scripted podcasts like NPR, Wondery, Gimlet Media, um, I did that with my name changers. A lot of a lot of scripting goes into that. It's very much like writing a speech. You write down every word you're going to say, and then you narrate it and you cut it and you know put it together in your in your program, and then mix it in with your interviews if you're doing some of those. Mix it in with some media like other podcasts or YouTube videos, and so it's very different just depending on what you want. So the best way to do that is to figure out what podcast you listen to, figure out what style you think you'll be best at. And then incorporating that into your podcast. Good. So there's, I mean, that just emphasizes the amount of research preparation. Uh, interviewing is not easy. There, you know, journalists go through a series of trainings for interviewing. So, so while Joe Rogan can easily mm -hmm. interview, first of all, he's done so many, so he's practiced and he's well trained and versed in this TV and you know journalism. But, you know, the whole area of social science has research methodologies on interviewing. And one thing that connects to one of our classes in, in entrepreneurship and innovation is the consulting class. Since we're dealing with design thinking and learning the design thinking methodology, since it's rooted in the methodologies of the social sciences, which include a research methodology as interviewing or, or observation and, and these types of things. So these are all directly connected to uh, best practices. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I would like to prompt the students if they have questions, maybe I have one more question for James. And then if you guys have any questions, I would like to either have you write them in the chat or uh, when we pivot after this question, last question that I have for James, maybe you wanna either ask it or um, if you feel comfortable turning your camera on, you can. If not, you can uh, raise your hand virtually or. Or, or chime in. But one thing that I want to ask you, James, because my students all, m many of my students have passions to creating their own company, initiative, project, being their own boss. And what I constantly find, which is common in the entrepreneurial and innovative uh, innovators journey, is getting over that hump to start, to, to, to remove that first roadblock to, if it's get something on paper, if it's to create some video or whatever the case may be, what advice do you have for anyone who has that monkey mind or that person in your head that says, no, don't do it or wait, 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 you're not ready yet. You're not, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do more and more and more. Um, it, and it becomes almost a barrier and an in, inhibitor to to making progress or, or starting. What advice do you have for for anyone who, who deals with that or is faced with that in uh, in their lives? A really good question. Yeah, uh, I mean, I definitely felt that many a time. Um, it's a classic advice is to start small. With my naming business, I first started it back in 2018, and the way I started it was on Fiverr and Fiverr. If you don't know, is a uh, it's a freelance website. It started out as people do anything for five dollars, and now it's grown more into a hub for freelancers to do things at pretty much any price now. Now they have Fiverr Pro, which is starting at a thousand dollars. And so for me, instead of just jumping into this naming business that I didn't know much about, I started a Fiverr gig, and I said, I'll name your company for fifty dollars. I'll name your podcast or blog for twenty five dollars. And the thing to do with that is Fiverr, although they take a 20% cut, they bring you clients. And those clients are going to teach you how to deal with clients in your space, how to you know, deliver. It's going to teach you about your system. So now I know my system of naming. It's going to teach you about meeting deadlines because Fiverr really sticks you to strict deadlines. Otherwise, they put down your rating, which you really need to be high because it's quite competitive on there. And again, it teaches you how to be competitive. You have competitors on there. When I first started the podcast naming on Fiverr, I was the only one. And now I've got three or four other people who are now doing podcast naming on Fiverr. So I got to step up with my branding. I got to step up with my portfolio on there. I got to step up with what am I going to do for, for you? So after about a year of Fiverr and having 
like I said, about 150 clients, I grew it into a more grand company. And now I have my own company called You Need a Name. And I worked with a mentor who was also um, in naming, and he helped me build that up too. Um, but yeah, I suggest is to always just start small, ask around if anyone needs your service or if anyone wants your product. And then from there, you can learn a lot and then build up and build up and build up. You don't need to do everything I want to get overwhelmed and then stop, which is exactly what happens to podcasters. They get overwhelmed and they stop. That's definitely my biggest advice. Thank you, James. I'd like to open the floor if any of the other guests might have a question. Daniel or Alyssa, uh, any thoughts, comments? What did you think of James's presentation? And uh, had, did it resonate with you or, or maybe questions you might have for James? Uh, I don't have any questions, but I'd just like to say that James, that was a great presentation. Yeah, you know, I can tell you're really good at speaking and it comes really naturally. Well, I don't know if it came naturally to you or because you've been doing it for so long, but I can tell that you're really good at it. So good job. I appreciate that, Daniel. At first it didn't come natural, but once you kind of like open the floodgates and practice, now it's it's like it was a hidden talent I had, and then I cultivated it, and now it's come natural. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. Alyssa, any, any thoughts, comments? I have a question. So when you tell people, you know, you have a podcast, a lot of people, you know, have a podcast now, and they're like, oh, whatever, you have a podcast, so does everyone else. But <laughs> what is one thing that most people wouldn't expect to be kind of under the umbrella of podcasting. One thing people wouldn't expect to be under the umbrella of podcasting. Uh, can you touch more specific? Or? Um, I don't have anything specific, but just like, you know, what is one thing that you going into it maybe you didn't expect would be one of your kind of roles or duties? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of people, you're absolutely right. A lot of people, Oh, I got a podcast. Check it out. Oh, I got a podcast. Check it out. And the thing about podcasts is that it is a lot of hard work. You got to figure out your mic setup. You got to learn how to edit. You've got, and some people have companies now that will edit your podcast for you. And that's great. Uh, I like to do everything hands-on. Uh, so I learn how to edit. Learn how to do storytelling, um, so you have to be a good storyteller, or learn to be a good interviewer if you were going to do an interview podcast. And then after all that, you have to figure out how to, if your graphic design is right, if your music is right, how to get it to your. So you become sort of a project manager uh, in a lot of ways. You got to make sure all the moving parts are working, and you're a supervisor to if you have somebody helping you, you become a supervisor. And you're like, oh, man, I just wanted to start this podcast talking about my favorite hobby. And now I'm a supervising, you know, a graphic designer and a social media guy. Oh, what happened here? So I think a lot of especially now it's kind of become your own micro business in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of people out there who are hungry to help. When I started my podcast, I had a few people contact me and say, hey, can I help you with your social media? Hey, can I make some videos? And I was just like, oh, man, I didn't expect. I thought I was going to do everything on my own. So then you have to learn to be a marketer, too, on social media. You have to go on other people's podcasts. Cold emailing is definitely um, what I think is one of the most important things in business. I don't know how much you guys talk about that. But um, I learned a lot about how to communicate with people in emails. And if you're not sure about how to cold email, there's a book called The Third Door by Alex Benayan that I highly suggest he talks to Tim Ferriss and they talk about how to cold email anybody. And he used the cold email template he puts in the book to get an interview with Maya Angelou, to get an interview with Pitbull, Bill Gates, tons and tons of famous people. And I use that same template now and it works like crazy. So third door, Alex Benayan, if you want to learn about cold emailing, but it's super important. Yeah. Just, you learn so much just in this endeavor. Um, but I think that's, uh, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it did. Thank you. That, James, that makes me really proud because one of the strengths and underlying foundations of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program 
is the idea of, of getting experience primarily through projects, real life projects that their students are building, working on. And while Daniel and Alyssa are in the foundational course of creativity innovation, if they continue on in the entrepreneurship program, you know, they will be working on a project, managing the many parts, putting them together for a presentation, doing research, doing interviews, uh, prototyping, testing, getting feedback, being their own graphic design, putting their template together, et cetera. So I couldn't be prouder of uh, hearing you saying the idea of becoming a project manager and you have to be a Swiss army knife in many of the t tools and areas that you you uh, need to be in, you, you know, unless you have deep pockets and just be able to outsource mm -hmm. all this, but exactly. that's not always the case. But um, James, uh, I couldn't be prouder. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, what I would like to do now, it, let's let's give James a virtual round of applause. Yeah. Um, yeah. For the last six to seven minutes, if there are questions regarding co class or coursework or topics that um, Daniel or Alyssa might be interested in, I'm, I'm open to answer anything. If you have questions about the content from class or how things connect, and hopefully we're able to make some of the connections from creativity and innovation to our master class on podcasting with James today. No, I don't have any questions. That was that was cool. Thanks for coming to talk to us today. I liked it. Good. So please share uh, your experience today. And my hope is that we have every three weeks or four weeks another opportunity to uh, get together virtually and 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 learn and share and grow and be together in this uh, remote learning time and, and environment. So uh, unless there's further questions, again, James, thank you so much for being with us uh, this morning and I'm grateful and we'll catch up soon. Thank you, I was happy to be here. It's nice to meet y'all. Daniel, Alyssa, uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have other questions going forward, but thank you again and until next time, episode two. Okay, thank you.